All right, folks, we are stepping out on stage, on the virtual stage. I'm going to say hello to everyone in the chat room. Hello, everyone in the chat room. Okay, uh, this is good. I'm excited to do the show. So we've got a lot of stuff to talk about, obviously. Um, are you guys afraid? Are you scared to talk about this stuff? There's some pretty hot topics on here. <laughs> no, no, no not at all. whenever I hang out with my photography buddies, this is the stuff we talk about it anyway. There's <laughs> just less beer right now. That's the only difference, I think. That's actually. true. Less <laughs> beer, yeah, well, I know. I've learned to to consume caffeinated beverages when I do podcasting because it, it directly affects the outcome of the final video, <laughs> depending, <laughs> depending on the, the beverage that I'm consuming. Okay, so this is gonna be good, guys. So we'll uh, we'll start the podcast in about a second here. Do you guys have any questions or anything on the notes before we dive into this the the actual recording of the show? No, I think I'm good. It looks good. Okay, good. Organizing good, good. my desktop so I got everything where it's supposed to be, so I can. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have to like take everything off of mine. I get I get distracted easily. So two you know. phones, tablets, <laughs> two big yeah. screens are not enough. It's not an, it's not enough landscape. I need more. You know what? You know what? Uh, not to delay the story of the show. Sorry, audience. But uh, you know, I, for years I had two monitors on my desktop, and I thought that was the way that I wanted to go. It was you know, I, I have one over here with pallets on it and one here, depending depending on what I was doing. And then I decided when the Retina iMac came out, which is what I'm using now, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to one. I'm going to go with a Zen, you know, kind of symmetrical Scandinavian desk, right? <laughs> and the desk is even Ikea, so it's really Scandinavian. So, you know, I did that. And now I'm back to, I, I really need another monitor. Like you actually have to get, then you don't have to, but I'm, I'm feeling constrained by my single monitor now. I need another one. <laughs> That's my justification for getting a Mac <laughs> Pro and another monitor. <laughs> the iMac Pro, which is, it's on my target list. All ah, right, guys. Don't waste, don't waste your money. You'll be fine. Just get a regular iMac. Just get rid of the iMac and get what? Uh, well, just get another one. Just get, you know. A regular there. one. Yeah, a regular one. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, see, stop with your logic, man. That's what. <laughs> or wait for next year. They're bringing out. I heard they're making three new Macs next year. So or this you could year, say you could say that same statement next year. This time it'll be oh, true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it does, but I'll be a year older. That's the one thing that's not changing. So, <laughs> all right, let's do this, guys. All right. So quiet on the set, and I'll uh, I'll start the show right here. This is my edit point for Final Cut Pro. <clears throat> I always get nervous at this point right here. Okay, here we go. Hey, folks, welcome back to TWIP, your source for grown-up photography news and conversation. Joining me today to discuss some of the week's biggest photo stories are Mr. Bruce Clark and Troy Miller. Hey, guys, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Hello. Good day. Did you say grown-up photography talk? Damn, I I'm in the wrong grown room. Up. <laughs> grown up. Grown <laughs> up. That was a subtle dig at, at there's there's a lot of there's a lot of not so grown up talk going on on the internet right now. So I want to strive to not be that, you know. Raise the bar. Raise the bar, you know, raise the tide, float all the ships or something. Um but let's let's start with you Troy. Yeah. What's the uh what's the deal with you, man? You're you've been shooting since like the Cretaceous period or something, right? <laughs> Yeah, 25, 26 <laughs> years this year, I think it is. Uh, started in film. I started shooting Hasselblads and, you know, and it was a hard transition to digital for me. It didn't happen on purpose, uh, but but I'm glad. Yeah, so shooting a long time. Wow, wow. And you, so you've been, how many years did you say? 20 what? 25. 25 years. So you started on film. So you've seen it all, right? You've seen, or a lot of it. I'm sure you learn something new every time, but you've seen a lot of craziness in your time, right? You probably have a lot of beer stories. <laughs> yeah, a lot. There's a, there was a lot of transition from the film time to the digital time that I think uh, was harmful for our industry that we're still trying to come out of. Okay, we're gonna talk about some of that stuff. All right, well, hold that thought. Bruce Clark, good what day, is going sir. on, man? Welcome, hey. welcome. You know, good to see you, man. It's been, I feel like it's been forever. It has. It has been forever since we've been on a podcast together. This will be the first of a gazillion more, hopefully. You yeah, know, it's, good to, so, yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're up in uh, you're up in Edmonton right now, right, Canada? I, I am. Yeah, that's where I'm hanging out. You've been up here. You've visited. I have. I yeah. have. I've been up there visiting. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can imagine it's a little chilly. You're the only one on the show with a sweater on. So. It's, uh, <laughs> let me let me just have a quick check. I think the last I checked, the temperature was it's a balmy it's a balmy minus twenty two Celsius right. Oh now. my! Yeah. <laughs> it's a little chilly today. <laughs> it's a little cold. Yeah, I got one word for that. Relocate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I'm waiting for those for those uh, agreement. They're trying to make an agreement with Australia that we can just like freely come and go between our countries and live <sighs> there. And I'm just I'm just waiting for that. Ah, oh, geez, yeah. Well, I feel bad for wearing a, a t shirt in my. <laughs> I mean, it's Northern California. It, it got pretty chilly here, so it was like I think it got down to sixty degrees oh, oh, Fahrenheit oh. today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad, pretty bad. All right, guys. Well, let's let's dive into the show. Uh, we've got a couple of big stories that I want to talk about. So obviously, this is this week in photo. So there's some new stories that I want to cover with you guys, and then we'll dive into the feature, which is all about the three big and three is an arbitrary number. Obviously, we may have more, um, but the three big mistakes that wedding photographers make or can make. So first story is Instagram. Instagram is about photography. So Instagram added or is adding in the process of adding the ability to pre-schedule posts, which I think a lot of people have been waiting for for a while. They're rolling it out to businesses first. And then they're saying sometime in 2019, it still feels weird to say 2019. (laughs) Sometime in 2019, they'll be rolling it out to us normal consumers. But it seems like a cool feature. I know there have been some third party services that have tried hacks to get around Instagram to allow you to post on a kind of a pre-scheduled, pre-loaded kind of basis. What do you think, Bruce Clark? Are you, uh, is this something that you're interested in or what? It is. And, you know, it, it's something that I currently do right now. Um, I use an app called Later, uh, which is a scheduler uh, that, you know, basically lets you go in and it's, you know, presents it in a calendar kind of view. And then you can, and I, the reason I use it, even not, not even for the scheduling, I just find it's a lot easier to type out you know, what I'm going to actually put as the caption and the hashtags and all of that kind of stuff, um, as opposed to doing it on my phone. I'm not, I'm not a millennial, so I don't, I don't text a lot. So I'm just, I'm not fast at typing on my phone. So I'm still a keyboard guy. So, um, so yeah, so I like to use it for that reason, but yeah, it lets you schedule them and then it's not a direct thing. It, it basically posts a reminder on your phone that says, Oh, Hey, you have a, a, a post that's ready to go. You have to open that app. And it, what it does is it copies the text so that you can then open the image in Instagram and then paste it. And so you still have, there's still a series of steps that you have to, you know, yeah. to go through to get the content out. So it's not perfect, but those are yeah. just some limitations of the Instagram ecosystem that they can't, you know, have their app directly post to, you know, to Instagram. Well, so. it's because they won't, right? It's nothing, nothing is impossible in the world of code, right? So <laughs> they're just not letting you do that. And there's other apps that let you do. There's one called Planoly, I think, that mm-hmm. uh, that does a similar thing. You can, you build out your posts, your Instagram posts on a schedule. And the cool thing about Planoly and those kinds of apps is you can build out a visual grid of the photos that you're going to be posting so that you can have when people visit your Instagram profile for the first time, they'll see a nice grid of nine images in the same color family, same genre, all that stuff, if you want that. So. Yeah, your, your aesthetic, if you're really concerned about your aesthetic on, on Instagram, and that's a big thing, you know, is you got to have this, it's got to be a pretty Instagram, it can't just be this mishmash and the things. So yeah, definitely, that's a use, useful for that too. So yeah, Troy. What what about you, man? I mean, are you are you a big Instagrammer? Does this 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 post scheduling feature interest you at all? Um, I'm I'm sure it'd be interesting for my wife, who does all of the <laughs> business end of everything. She is the our social media person, so I'm sure she'll think it's great. I, if if you look at my personal Instagram, I post like once every two weeks, so it's really not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> but she posts every day. I mean, yeah. So something like this would be really cool for her. Yeah, I think I think she would really dig it. Well, on the on the Instagram tip, there's there's a, there's two big questions that I want to throw at you guys. The first one is the idea of scheduling posts. Does that? I mean, yeah, it's cool, and it's like okay, I can time shift. I can just spend an afternoon bulk loading the next month and a half, and I'm done. Does does doing that take away from the kind of immediacy and hey, I'm seeing what this person is doing right now ness of of a social media platform like that? Like, or, or, I mean, I don't know. I mean, cause it, I think it kind of speaks to what Instagram is doing. Cause they roll it out to businesses first. Cause businesses, yeah, sure. We're having a, a Valentine's day sale. Let's pre program all of our, our posts for the week before Valentine's day and roll up to that. But the average consumer 
why would we want to pre-schedule posts if we're just telling people what we're having for lunch? Troy, what do you think? Well, for my personal page, I wouldn't. Um, but for my business page, for my wedding page, uh, I would, I could definitely pre post cause those things are pre thought out their wedding teasers or their, or their congratulations to anniversaries or things like that for my clients. So it would be, it would be great to be able to schedule those. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, Bruce, what do you think? I mean, does it take some of the magic away from the, or the spontaneity? I think there's kind of two camps, right? You, you've got those that use Instagram as, as more of a daily sort of spew of here's what I'm eating for lunch and here's where I am and here's what I'm doing. That's a good word, spew and right. lunch. I like right. that, the same sentence. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then there's others that want to use it as more of a marketing tool, as a mechanism for showing off their work as, almost as a portfolio. Um, and then I think in the middle of all that, you've got Insta stories. Right. So for me, yeah. you know, I, I tend to use, you know, at, at the beginning of Instagram, I was kind of, you know, here's what I'm having for lunch. Here's more personal stuff on there. And I, I sort of moved away from that and just started to try to focus on posting my portrait and wedding work through the, the actual posts. And then more of the day to day, like what am I up to behind the scenes, that kind of stuff. I put that out on Insta stories. So the ability to kind of schedule that stuff is kind of nice. Like you say, you can sit down at that one. You've got a chunk of time. You can schedule out some posts. Uh, and then, it, you know, so that there's some constant activity on your account, because I think that's the biggest thing in terms of engagement, driving traffic and getting people to see your posts is you have to be posting regularly, particularly with, you know, they keep changing these Insta the, the algorithms. And, you know, one day it's, you know, your posts are showing up the next day, they're not showing up. And it's this constant kind of game that has to be played. And there's this move towards, you know, being able to have to pay to play kind of thing where you gotta yeah. just, you know, boost your posts. And I right. don't know, it's, it's almost, you got to have a full time job just keeping up with that. So the ability yeah. to just, you know, schedule some content to have it go out and then use Insta stories for kind of the day to day minutia of what's going on in the world of, of, of Bruce Clark is, is kind of the way I've, I've adopted yeah. Instagram at the moment. So and how are how are you both of you guys chime in at will how how are both of you guys using instagram well troy you know you're not using it. well your wife's using it maybe <laughs> you should bring her on camera here <laughs> how how are you guys using uh instagram in your businesses like like on a on a brass tack standpoint like are you are you posting photos of of like the engagement shoot to to drum up excitement or are you running ads like what what kind of what's what's the usage Ours is very much a uh, transparent feed of what we've been up to, our latest work. And we highlight, uh, we do teasers from weddings. We do, like I said, birthdays or anniversaries. We put those out there. It's a way for us to keep in touch with our couples, really. But it, more than anything, it's a portfolio. And it's a history that they can go through and go, oh, wow, they've shot here. Or, you know, see my work day. And they can look at the dates. Like, oh, they posted two days ago. Here's a wedding couple they posted three days ago. Here's another wedding couple or here's Margie's cookies. If you follow the feed, you'll see the cookies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it just keeps us in touch with them in a real world kind of manner, which I think is super important today. Yeah, yeah. Bruce, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, same same here. You know, we I've been trying to do a lot of our sneak peeks first on Instagram, um, mm -hmm. just trying to encourage, you know, our clients to, to follow us. It's sort of, if you want to see the sneak peek, that's where it's going to be first, followed by Facebook, uh, you know, and then our blog. And that's, uh, you know, that's worked fairly well for us, um, but also just connections with other vendors, uh, being able to, you know, tag them and show off their work. So if it's, you know, a florist or if it's I'm working with, you know, a, a cake, cake designer or it's, you know, a venue or what have you, right, tagging them and, and featuring mm -hmm. some of their content and things for that kind of that cross promotion and, and cross marketing. But uh, a lot yeah, of it's focused on the clients. But. Yeah, that's that's actually an amazing point, too, because um, being able to tag the vendors at a wedding for the cake mm. that you shot is a way for them to, to, to react to you almost immediately. So we do that a lot. We, Margie, does that a lot. <laughs> yeah, the royal we, right? <laughs> yeah, the royal we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting where things are going with this, with just Instagram in general, because one of the... Um, yeah, I had made a note to, to bring this up a couple of weeks ago. I got, I'd gone to a barber and I was like, oh, you know, I got my hair cut. And I'm like, well, OK, how do I book you again? And he's like, oh, you just follow me on Instagram and book me through there. I'm like, this is really is that that one sentence made me feel old because I'm like kids today. Really? <laughs> In my day, we had websites that you could. <laughs> Your and day. Was Instagram and Facebook and scheduling guys. I don't know. It, it's cool. Well, <laughs> folks in the audience. Oh, one thing before we move on from this. Um, 
Steve Brazel in the chat room brought up a good point that there's no Instagram app for, or sorry, there's no, <laughs> there's no iPad app for Instagram, right? Right? Why is that? I mean, it seems like the iPad is a big, beautiful screen, screen, and that you'd want to have. Seems like the ideal platform for this. Well, I, I understand the mobility of having a mobile phone with you all the time, but especially now with them moving more business and scheduling and people using it for things other than just showing pictures of their lunch, it seems like a logical move would be iPad, guys. What, what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't mind seeing it, but I mean, I would probably still primarily do the bulk of what I do with it through, through the phone. Cause that's what I have yeah. with me. the stories sure. and things like that. But yeah, you're right. In terms of, uh, you know, having a bigger device, a larger screen to have that, but they've always been pretty closed off to, you know, even just, you know, they don't even have a web-based app that you can go mm -hmm. to post. Yeah. To. You can go and view the content on your, through a browser, but you can't actually, you know, upload or update it through there. So. Yeah. I want it. I want, all bases covered. I want an Instagram app on my a native Mac OS app and or Windows. If you're on Windows, a native desktop app. I want a phone app. I want an iPad app and I want an Apple TV app. So I want if I'm going to if I'm going to commit to a platform, I want a little micro ecosystem or microcosm of apps that I can use depending on where I am and what I'm doing at the time. I don't want to have to be, OK, I'm engaged with my Mac now. I'm doing stuff. Oh, I want to post something on Instagram. Where's my phone? OK, let me go do that. You know, I should be able to do it all on the same screen and, and not have to change the way that I work for, you know, an app. I don't know. No, I agree. Me. I agree totally. When I go to have a, a lunch meeting with friends or I'm going to go sit down and do a creative session, I want—I only want to take my iPad because I have all kinds of other notes and stuff on there. It would be nice to be able to interact with all the platforms in the same place. Yeah, that's what the web was for. But they give you a web app. You can you can go to Instagram on the web, but it's like a view only experience. You can't do anything there. Right. I don't know. I'm complaining. I'm starting to feel. I'm starting to be that that old man. <laughs> Get off my lawn. In my day, they had multi platform apps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel bad. I feel bad. All right, guys, let's move on. So the next story that we want to touch on is GoPro. So GoPro, um, well, the GoPro has their service. I'm going to pull it up here. GoPro has their their service. Uh, it's kind of a, a replacement service or a subscription for $5 a month. It's called GoPro Plus, where, you know, it's kind of like an insurance thing. And But they've, they've added... Uh, a feature to it where they will replace your device, your broken camera, which makes a lot of sense for an action cam because presumably action cams, if they're doing their jobs right, are in harm's way, right? <laughs> they're on the front of a surfboard or on somebody's helmet that's doing something crazy. So they tend to get broken. So they've offered this service. Um, that's cool. The feature itself is cool. It's pretty self-explanatory. But my question is, I wanted to put it to you guys about GoPro overall. So GoPro, we talked about previously that they they were doing, they announced that they were getting out of the drone business, the karma, they had bad karma, let's say that. <laughs> karma. <laughs> and, and, and they they kind of acquiesced the market to DJI and the other players there. So what, what what's to become of GoPro? Troy, but armchair, uh, armchair quarterback, man, you're in the boardroom right now. You know you what? Got, I, you I got would stockholders. You got stockholders on the conference call and you got to explain to them what you're doing in 2018. What do you say? So I, I, I would say as a stockholder, <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, you, you, I've been oh, you own GoPro stock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Contain Perfect. yourself a little bit. <laughs> okay. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just I'm just enjoying the irony. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. You know, Go GoPro is an amazing company and they have amazing products and and they just I think they sort of lost their way and they just need to refocus. You know, many mm -hmm. many companies have done that over time. I just think they need to to refocus on what their core product is and I think they can do it. I'm really hoping they do. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, though. I mean, you can refocus on your core product, but that's like, you know, the core product has been refocused on by lots of other entities already. So they're no longer it used to be that they were the pioneers in the action cam space and there were no other players. And they, you know, they almost became synonymous with the action cam GoPro, like, you know, Xerox is to copies. GoPro was to these go everywhere cameras. But now there's Sony. There's Nikon, there's, you know, everyone's in the market doing their own spin. And sometimes, uh, arguably, 
they're out GoPro and GoPro in their own space, which is, you know, kind of what Silicon Valley is all about. So with, under that, yeah, I mean, maybe, but under that light, like, what can they do? I mean, they said, okay, uh, here's devil's advocate. GoPro goes, you know what? All right. We invented this. We had to deal with DJI. DJI decides we're going to make our own cameras. And they did that. And, and that's what they're doing now. And now they say, you know what? We're going to make our own drones and out DJI, DJI. That didn't work out so well. So what's the next big broad stroke move that they can do? But not not everybody is into drones. You're assuming that every GoPro owner wanted to be a drone owner. True. And they may not even know that there was a drone that came and went. You know, when yeah. I'm at weddings, I see I see guys walking around all the time with a little GoPro and they're doing their own little shots and doing their own little films. I don't see a lot of the other action cams are doing that. So I want it. It's hard to say without being yeah, seeing yeah. them and, and knowing the numbers, but you know, I'm holding out, man. I'm holding out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding Too on late to, my to sell now. <laughs> Can't sell now. <laughs> See, you sound like you're in a bad marriage. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know what? I've been doing this for 25, 30 years. We might as well just stick it out now. <laughs> it's for the kids, for the this. children. That's yeah, right, those, right. Stay in for the children, for the other, the other stocks in the portfolio. Bruce, what do you think, man? The armchair quarterback, same question. What would you tell the stockholders? Oh, that's a tough one because, you know, I, I had a GoPro. I was really excited about GoPros when they first came around, you know, and I, and I had one. I had a GoPro 2, I want to say. So one of the early ones. And I thought, oh, this would be kind of a neat thing to have. And I'll, you know, I'll take it on some trips and we'll do some things with it. And it just, it never really got used, sadly. Um, yeah. And so actually, I actually just sold it a, like a few weeks ago. I was kind of doing some, you know, new year and house cleaning and going through some stuff. And I said, oh, what's this? Oh, yeah, this GoPro. I haven't used it in forever. So I threw it up on well, Kijiji, which is like Craigslist, basically, um, mm -hmm. and, and sold it and got rid of it because well, I'm not using it. I may as well get something for it. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I I used one, but then but then just yesterday, I think I watched Nicole Young. I don't know if you saw. She posted a video. She did some some shark diving with great oh, white sharks. No, I saw that flash by. I need to go and, check that and, out. And she posted this awesome video that she put together of diving with great white sharks. And I believe she used a GoPro for that. And I was like. Well, damn, maybe I need one of these GoPros yeah, again. Yeah. But, but the new ones are nice. I, yeah. So I was like, but you know what? It would be one of those impulse things. Like I recently got into, we just got back in November. We were in Portugal and I bought one of the, I, I never can pronounce it right. The Zhiyun. It, it was the DJI Osmo, the mobile, the, you know, for your phones, the stabilizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bought one of those and I took that with us. And and actually I just posted the, on my Facebook, just a, a, a video that I shot when we were over in Portugal, all on my iPhone with that and, and had a lot of fun with that. So, yeah. you know, it's, that was pretty cool. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus more on that. I find those, those kinds of things I'm getting a little bit more enjoyment out of, but certainly that there's more competition, like you said, in the GoPro space. Yeah. Um, and you know, they, it's a mature product to some extent now too, right? So where else do they go with it? What else can they do with it? And once you have one of these things, particularly now, if you subscribe to their replacement plan, you know, where is the the motivation to actually go out and buy the next new one? If yeah. you know, the one you have is currently doing everything you need it to do and you can get a new one, I think it's what, twice a year replaced if you're subscribing mm -hmm. to this plan, yeah. where's the motivation to go out and, you know, buy one of these, you know, buy the newest one or the latest one, right? So well, I don't you, know where I they go. One of the other things you said was 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 a really good point, and that's that they made these things. GoPro made some, and they they continue to make some really really good hardware, right? So, and they have to make it good because it's going to be stressed to the maximum, right? So, then that becomes it's going to last a long time, <laughs> and when the next one comes out, do I really need it since this one is still working just fine? So, yeah, I'm anxious to see what they do. I mean, GoPro is an important company in the photography space. And like some folks in the chat room are saying that they're, you know, there's a lot of love for GoPro in the chat room right now. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah good I mean, pronounce, he said, you know, he doesn't like the, the square form factor. So could they do something along the lines of a different form factor, maybe? Sure. Is, is there not? opportunity? Like, is there need for that? Like, I, you know, I don't know what the use case scenarios would be for different form factors, but perhaps mm -hmm. somebody in the chat room that, that, that you know, uses or, you know, could give us some suggestions as to what they would see. Maybe that's a, an area they could look at. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The other thing that they could look at, I haven't seen a recent GoPro. I, I owned one of the first ones like you did, Bruce. Um, I haven't, I haven't had owned one of the recent ones, but I remember um, struggling, let's say, 
to put it mildly with the operating system and getting around in there and figuring out. I remember specifically sitting on the couch trying to figure out how to do a time lapse pressing buttons and doing this and making selections and, <laughs> yeah. all. and I was like, I just want to do a time lapse. There's three buttons to do it. I, three taps. I can do it on my iPhone. What am I doing in here? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So Troy, and Troy, if you have any pull with the company, please tell them, you know, that you'd like some, you know, some UI love in that thing. I still have my stock and I still have my old GoPro. So uh, I don't, I'm never getting rid of them, you know? <laughs> See, you're the problem. See, you should be trashing those things every new release and getting new ones. You gotta I, don't have a, I don't have a use for them. That's the problem. <laughs> if I had a use for them, I would be out buying new GoPros. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you own them? Then? Why did you buy them if you don't have a use for them? I bought them to shoot time lapse at weddings. It, oh, it okay. was it was great. I, I but the problem was it took a lot of time time to put them together, and I couldn't yeah. monetize that. So they ended up sitting in my bag, and you know now they sit in my bag. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So lots of like, we're gonna we're gonna folks in the chat room. We will dive in there and interact with you in a later segment um, as we after we get through these main topics here. Thank you all. There's a vibrant conversation going on in there. <laughs> so, yeah, there is. Yeah, trying to keep up. And <laughs> I love it. It's like a party going on in the other room that I can't not go even interested in us. Yeah, <laughs> no. we just provided background noise for them to hang out and chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, the last one that I want to touch on is about Lightroom. So there's a story that came out from uh, let's pull, let me pull this up real quick uh, from Petapixel, our friends over at Petapixel. And um, it was basically all about Adobe last year admitting that Lightroom is slow. I mean, <laughs> really? <laughs> Because we so, had no idea. Right? Was like, exactly we had no clue. In other news, <laughs> in other news, the sky is up. Edmonton right? is cold. <laughs> exactly. Canada is cold. Um, yeah. So I wanted to. So obviously, that's a that's a foregone conclusion. That Lightroom. It's yeah. It's it's slow, but you know, it is. It's not the slowest app out there. So I wanted to throw it to you guys as professional shooters. Like, how does it impact you? Because if are, well, first of all, are you using Lightroom? Secondly, every second counts, I would imagine, when you are processing thousands of images like you guys generate for one of the events that you shoot. Does the slowness of an app equate to money down the toilet? Or do you care, Troy? What do you, what oh, do you think? I, I totally care. I don't I don't know if you, if it equates to money, but time is money, they say, right? So yeah. if I spend three hours editing a wedding, um, and I could do it in two, <clears throat> that means I can catch, you know, an, another hour of the new Star Trek. That's got, you know, I, I, it's <laughs> stuff like that. That's, that matters to Discovery. me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not only that, it's frustrating. It's so frustrating uh, to see things lag and the, the screen not draw properly and so on and so forth. And I'm, and I'm running one of the latest iMacs. It's not an iMac Pro, but it's a top end iMac and it's better. Mm -hmm. But it's frustrating. I mean, I'm click, go, I'm ready. I'm ready to move the slider and you're not ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, click and wait, click and wait, click and wait. And that right. adds up with yeah. thousands of images. Yeah. And so you are using Lightroom? That's your. That's what you use to process your weddings? I use Lightroom and Capture One. So and right Capture now One. I'm in the process of transferring or sort of moving my uh, workflow to Capture One. All my personal stuff is Capture One. Absolutely mm -hmm. love it. I've been doing, I've been working in Lightroom for so long that to, you know, change my workflow to, to, to Capture One has been a bit of a struggle, um, but I'm there. I'm almost there. And uh, that's a that's a whole long discussion, but it's amazing. I love Capture One. Yeah, we'll have to do a show on that because there was a, a there was a, a really good thread in the Twip Pro community about Capture One and people moving over to Capture One and and you know the some there was it was both sides there was like it's hard, like they were basically people were echoing what you were saying it's hard to get your brain out of the pattern the lightroom pattern and into the 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 capture one metaphor but once you do it's glorious is what i is the takeaway yeah, that i got yeah and there's there's a level of tools in capture one that lightroom doesn't even come close and when they came out with their lightroom cc and they they changed the other one to Lightroom Classic. I just really felt like, oh, that's that's it. They're done with me, you know. And then Capture One is pushing layers and so much much more depth of control. I'm yeah. like, okay, all right, that's that's where I want to be. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What, what about you, Bruce? Yeah. Are you a, are you a Lightroom user? And I does am, it actually, affect you? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I use it regularly, and I actually teach it as well. So I teach it at a local photography school here, and I just actually finished having my Lightroom class this past weekend. And you know, the the slowness for me is a big issue, particularly when they're dealing with large, you know, these large raw files that we deal with as wedding photographers. You know, we're throwing three, four, five thousand photos at it from a from a wedding. And it's just glacially slow. And they keep saying, you know, oh, give it more hardware and give it, you give it more hardware and it doesn't, still doesn't help. Nope. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've done some updates. There, there's the, the most recent update that came out uh, a couple of months ago, or I guess back October, November, whatever it was, was supposed to be, you know, some, some performance improvements. <sighs> I haven't really noticed that much. It's, it's very, very minor. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a mature piece of software now too, right? So the, the challenge with, with mature software is it has this legacy of code behind it that unfortunately kind of sometimes handcuffs them and they almost have to get to a point where they, they throw it out and start over again. But that's a very difficult proposition, I understand, from software development. So then, of course, their answer was, well, okay, well, we'll just take the existing product and, and we'll come out with a new product, but we'll name it the na same name of the existing product. And then we'll name, and it was just, you know how many people were confused in my class? And I was trying to explain <laughs> like what the differences between were Lightroom Classic CC and Lightroom CC. And oh my God, I was ready to pull my hair out. Well, can you just, can you explain it to us here, please? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It, basically. Do, we, go ahead. Basically, go ahead. <laughs> basically, Lightroom CC is is for for people shooting on these things on phones, right? On mobile, and they want to have all their photos up on Adobe's cloud storage. Whereas yeah. mm -hmm. the classic is more your traditional desktop workflow, where you're going to have your your photos stored locally, you know, on hard drives and, and things like that. So it's really two you know two completely separate apps um, they've tried to really simplify it dumb it down stripped out a lot of functionality and features but right now the problem with it is it's an all or nothing so either all your images go in their cloud or none of them if you go the lightroom cc route and it can be a very expensive proposition to go you know all your images in the cloud you're looking at 20 bucks a month for one terabyte of storage which you know these days isn't a heck of a lot yeah that's not um, enough that's not enough space no. that's that won't even yeah that no. won't even cut it so, you know, so it's just, you know, I'd like to see them focus on the core product, right? That's what majority of people are using. I'd, I'd love to see how many people are actually using this Lightroom CC product that they're putting all this time resources into that they could be spending and putting on actually making the Lightroom classic product a decent product. Because if they if they don't, they're going to start losing the professional photographers. And yeah. I, I know lots of people doing the same thing. They're jumping to Capture One. There's other products coming out. You know, On One has been pushing really hard the last, the last year or so with their On, on One Raw. Uh, I think Mac Fun is, is Luminar. They're working on on something to, that's going to have a cataloging and a develop. You know, so there there's definitely increased competition, and they're looking at it. You know, they're countering Adobe's move to you. Your only option is you've got to subscribe monthly. They're coming out with products that you can buy for a one time fee, right? Which so I they're kind of right. So you know that lock in might kill them. The, the challenge <laughs> for me is I use a lot of the other Adobe products. I've started to mm. get into doing some stuff with video, so I'm using Premiere. You know, yeah. I do some stuff with, you know, obviously with Photoshop. So you've got those other components of their ecosystem that I feel I'm kind of tied into. And there's not really great alternatives, uh, you know, to something like Photoshop. Yeah, there probably is. But, you know, yeah. You know, then but then again, you hit that you hit that learning curve thing. You know, even if you if you move to something that's that's close to what you need for Photoshop, there's still that the barrier to entry, especially if you're a working photographer. Right. And you have to change the wheels on the tie on the on the race car while you're still in the race. You know, it's it's uh, it's not easy. Hey, yeah. let me I want to address. There's a I see some comments in the chat room that there's a lot of lag in the in the stream i'm not sure why that is but i would recommend you guys stick with us if you can if not this video will be posted back onto the twip youtube channel because we're recording it here as well so it'll be posted back to the twip youtube channel and also to the podcast feed so not to worry it is not going away all right uh let's move on to the next thing here uh we'll get off lightroom's back and uh, talk talk about we've been on every we've been on everybody's back Instagram, alone. <laughs> Instagram GoPro and Lightroom. We just been you know negative Nellies today. All right, so let's talk about let's continue the negative streak and talk and talk about the worst wedding photographer mistakes. Right. So I really wanted to hone this down. I know you guys have had a couple of weeks to think about this. So. The and you guys have been shooting for years or decades, right? So, Troy, I want to start with you, man. 
What's your number one, the worst wedding photographer, the photographer mistake? And I didn't say photography. So wedding photographer mistake. It could be business related. It could just be taking the wrong gear to a wedding. It could be it, how do you, you interacted with a bride incorrectly? Like what? what's your number one? <laughs> you're you're reading my list over here. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, well, what is going to be my number one? Um <laughs> Um, I got to say, out, out of fairness, I'm thinking like, okay, it's not going to be fair just to talk about other photographers, right? Like, I got to think, what is my number one? And, you know, I had an amazing mentor when I got started. And uh, Bob Fletcher, a good friend of mine who I've introduced you to, you know, he uh, he walked me through the paces. He made it possible for me not to make so many of the mistakes, you know, like attire and how do you behave um you know, in the, in the back of a church during a service, you know, those, how do you talk to the mom and the, the bride? How do you get them to work? So um, I missed a lot of that because I had somebody to help me. Mm -hmm. But what I hear from my vendor friends who, who come and go, oh, God, Troy, I'm so glad you guys are here today <laughs> because it's, it's not knowing how to shoot a wedding. And, and I know that's kind of general. They don't know their gear. They don't know the flow of the day. Um, they don't know how to pose. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you, we, we can be more specific, but you know, there's things like chimping every single shot because they're unsure about their gear. They don't know what to do. Um, asking the DJ, okay, what do I do next? You know, oh, God. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a bigger thing, I think, than specificity for me. I mean, uh, maybe Bruce has some more ideas. Um, but there's a lot. I don't want to take up all the time. No, no, <laughs> it's good. Going. It's good. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, that was that was going to be my kind of one of mine anyway. Like, there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong and and mistakes that can be made. And I'm sure we've you know we've all made the mistakes at some point in our careers, and and you have to l use those as learning opportunities for sure. But you know, I think there's this there is this need or this want or this desire to just to be this overnight success without putting in the time and, and really learning and honing your craft before you jump into something, particularly like a wedding. You know, a wedding is, a, you, it, there's no do-overs on a wedding, you know, unless maybe if you're a Kardashian or, a, you know, Elizabeth Taylor or something, <laughs> you get a few cracks at it. But for the most part, a wedding happens. It's a, one, it's a once in a lifetime event that the events that happen on a wedding, they only happen once. And if you're, you know, if you're, if you've just bought a digital camera at Christmas time, uh, you know, and, and in, you know, January, you suddenly have a wedding photography business. Um, there's a problem there. You're, you're not, you're not ready to jump in and take on the responsibility of a wedding, but I see it all the time. I teach photography and I see students that come and they're struggling with their gear and they don't understand aperture and shutter speed and ISO. And, uh, you know, they're trying to learn flash and they haven't learned the basics of photography. And they're like, well, I've, you know, I'm, I asked them, you know, why are you in the class today? So, well, I've got a wedding in a couple months. Like, well, <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, yeah. you know, they, they've, some of them have never, I had one, she had a wedding coming up and she's never been to a wedding. Oh, that was, hurts like, my 19, heart. That just, she was 19 or 20 years old. She'd never been to a wedding before. And I said, how, how can you possibly go in and photograph a wedding? If you've never, never even been to a wedding, you don't even know what to expect. And, 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 you know, as Troy mentioned some of the things that, you know, they don't know anything about posing. They don't know how to conduct themselves. You know, we've had, uh, it hasn't happened to us because my wife's my second shooter. So I'm in the fortunate position that I've got a great second shooter, but I know other photographers who've had, you know, second shooters that come along to help them on the wedding day and they show up in blue jeans and a t-shirt mm. or, you know, just, or act unprofessionally, uh, you know, you know, at the wedding and th these kinds of things. So I think it's a lot of people just, they want this overnight success. They don't want to put in the effort or the work to actually hone their skills. You know, they, they steal somebody else's photos off the internet. Uh, they slap yeah. up a Wix page, a Wix website, or a, or a Facebook page, uh, and boom, you know, Bob's your uncle. I'm I'm a, I'm a wedding photographer overnight, right. and or they go and do a, or they go and do a stylized shoot with a bunch of vendors, and they get flowers, and they get a bride, and then they go and they post that on their website, and they go, oh, you know, here's my wedding work. Well, that's a stylized shoot. That that that's not that's not the crunch time. I mean, we have this saying, and, and my wife is my second shooter as well. So during the day, she'll come up to me and she gives me countdowns, how much time I have before the next thing. And her big thing is seven minutes. She'll come yeah. over and she goes, you've got seven. And that tells me I got seven minutes to finish the Romantic Scenics because I booked 45. It rained that day. You know, everything looks easy when it's beautiful. 
but it's it's usually not. No, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bruce, what you guys are saying, it, it sounds like you guys are just you're you're saying what I'm what I'm kind of distilling from all this is professionalism and preparedness. Right. So like, right. Bruce, you were saying someone <clears throat> taking a course or a class or a seminar a couple of weeks to get ready for a wedding is to me, that's kind of like you know, someone's going to get operate or a dentist is going to go, going to pull a tooth. And he's like, yeah, I got to take this course on how to pull mold, molars. Cause I have a molar to do next month. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. 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 Or a pilot saying, you know, I got to teach me how to use these controls. I'm going to fly a 747 over to Japan next week. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pilots even worse. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I got to learn how to fly his plane because I got to take a, a thousand people to this place. Yeah. It's uh, it's not cool. OK, so preparedness. I'm going to mark that down as number one. Preparedness. What's number two? I want to go. I want three. So what's the Bruce? I'll give I'll, I'll put you on the hot seat. What's All the right. second the second big mistake that uh, that wedding photographers make? Oh, boy. Um, Probably not paying enough attention to the business side of of things, right? It's it's. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of wedding photographers get drawn into and pulled into wedding photography because they're they like photography and it's there's there's this you know they like the the, the you know the, the romance they like capturing the images they're really good at that. But most wedding photographers, if you talk to them, the part of the business that they that they hate is the business side of it, right? And dealing with contracts and dealing with you know questions that come up and dealing with difficult situations, but not having themselves set up for success um, mm -hmm. as a proper business, not treating it like a proper business. Um, there's a there's a real, you know, challenge right now. <clears throat> there's a real kind of race to the bottom, it seems. Uh, everybody's, you know, jumping ahead of everybody else to see who can be the cheapest uh, and, and, and do this. And it makes, it puts this downward pressure on it. It's just not sustainable, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's a real challenge is if you want to have, you know, you want to make a go of it, you want to make a career of it. Um, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough industry and you have to, you got to have yourself set up for it. So I see a lot of photographers also that don't put the proper time and thought and attention into the business side of it, um, yeah. as well. So, and what does that mean? So the business side, does that mean you should be hiring a CPA to help you set your books up? Does that mean, and Trey, I'll, I'll aim this at you because I know you're, you're running down this road as well. So does that mean hiring professionals to handle the things that you can't do well? Does it mean signing up for a fresh books or a quick books or some kind of accounting software so that you can manage things or what, what, what's, what is making sure you have your business covered mean? You know, I think it's I think it's a lot of stuff, and 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 uh, Bruce really hit on a point that I think is super important because I do a lot of teaching at an organization as well, and I try to mentor a lot of people. They don't understand how to charge taxes properly, um, mm. how to price their work. You know, that's that for me is one of my biggest hangups. I mean, I think everybody knows. I've got to pay taxes. I've got to collect taxes. I'm not quite sure what, you know, how to do that. Let's go ask the, you know, the accountant for the questions. Um, but the biggest thing is, is how to price their work. And, you know, you bring somebody in who's new and they think, oh, well, I'm going to look at the industry around me and the average photographer here is $3,000, $4,000. Well, I, I, I'm going to shoot wedding, so I should be somewhere in there. And it's, it's not because, uh, if you overcharge for what you can deliver, you're only going to disappoint that client. And then that client is going to forever think, well, this is how wedding photographers are. You know, it's, it's, they're going to be expensive and I'm going to have to tell them how to shoot. And we are constantly having to prove to our uh, brides and our couples that that's not going to happen with us, right? Maybe they had a bad experience because that photographer did that. And sometimes it's innocently, you know, a new photographer wants to start out, they undercut their price to get some work. And what they don't realize is they're setting themselves up for failure in the future because now people assume, oh, well, well, it's $600 is a fair price. They'll be there for 12 hours. You know, how are you mm -hmm. any better? Yeah. And on the surface, right? Like looking at a website, reading a list of options, it makes sense, right? It's hard to see that difference. So the business side is is a lot more than just what you charge. We're we're counselors, we're therapists, we're, you know, our brides will send us photos of what their table decorations look like. Well, what do you guys think? Or here's my veil. You know, what do you think of this cathedral veil? Do you like this? Will this photograph well? You know, and you have mm -hmm. to, you have to be there. That's all part of the business. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna charge X amount of money and I'm gonna go shoot. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna have a little no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, no. 
it's the lure of the spreadsheet, right? It's like, you know, like in internet marketing, it's a little number multiplied by a big number equals a really big number. So, hey, if I just, if I charge $1,200 a wedding and I can squeeze in two weddings a weekend, how many weekends are there in the year? <laughs> so, that's a lot of money. I'm rolling in it. I'll have my Tesla by this time next year. Right? Well, some, some perspective is I don't do more than 30 weddings a year, right? So mm. that's 30 weekends out of what would that be 52 or what well, those 104 like 52 weeks 104 saturday and sundays even more you're like mm -hmm. dude you're not even working I, yeah. I i i meet with my clients eight times engagement wow. shoots sales meetings phone call i mean 30 for me and i know there's people that do more but 30 yeah. for me that's it i'm wiped out i want to give yeah. that's how my business works you know yeah. Because at 31, at 31, you're you're not delivering the product that people would expect you to deliver, right? Because now you're exhausted right. and you can't spend as much time on the other weddings. You know, you found your number, right? Some people's number may be 40, some people's may be 20, but you found your number, right? Bruce, right, do you have a right. number like that or do you just... Take 15, as many as you can pack in there. No, you know, fifteen to twenty is my is my number here. Um, you know, we have a we have a really uh, retracted season too here because of the obviously the weather and the climate. You know, winter weddings they're becoming a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, common. But certainly, a lot of people from you know here from basically November till about May, it, it's crickets for wedding season. It's pretty quiet, right? So you really have six months at most to that. That's kind of when you got to make your 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 you know, your season is in six yeah. months. And, you know, I know some photographers here right now, it's, it's a tough economy right now where we live and the, the economy is still kind of recovering. You know, I know photographers who, you know, rely on having 15 to 20 weddings a year to, to make a, you know, to make ends meet. Um, and I know some photographers last year in, in our city here who, who dropped suddenly to two weddings, you know, so when you're, you know, when you Jeez. go from 20 weddings to two weddings, uh, that's, that's harsh. Right. And, right, and right. I'm talking to a lot of wedding photographers this year in the city where I live, it's the same boat for a lot of people, a lot of fantastic, exceptional photographers who I know do fantastic work. They've been in the industry a long time talking to them and they're like, you know, how's your year looking? How's your season looking? And they're all kind of in the same, you know, they're, they're like, I've got six weddings this year. I've got, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to look, maybe look for another job. So it's, it's tough, right? And uh, you've got so many now that are they're coming into the market. There used to be a time when I knew a, a lot of the photographers in the city, and now you go to a meetup or you know we're part of these you know different Facebook groups and whatnot, and there's you know hundreds, and nobody knows who anybody is anymore. And uh, so that's also not helped uh, the market too. It's just this influx yeah. and flood of you know new photographers that have come into the market, but they've come in at such a low rate, you know, because maybe they have a full time job, so for them it's a little bit of side pocket money. Um, so they're not treating it like a real business. And so that becomes, it becomes really hard. And then when they want to make that leap, they find themselves in an industry and in a business that's tough because nobody's making a go of it, you know, right. so it's this constant yeah. sort of, it's this constant cycle. But we've heard about that. That, that was an argument I remember from way back in the Pictage days. You guys remember Pictage? I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember back that one of the arguments that was going on back in those days was the shoot to burn uh, photographers being the enemy of the high end photographer. In other words, so people that are, are listening to or watching this, it was the, the photographers that would say, Hey, you know what? For 500 bucks, I'll show up at your wedding. I'll shoot it and I'll give you a disc. I'll burn a DVD with all the JPEGs or raws or whatever. And then you have at it and do what you want. And my hand, I wash my hands. Just give me my check. I'm out of here, mm -hmm. you know? And, I'm curious to know what you guys think about that. Were, were those people, did they permanently damage the market and the perception and the value of the artisanship behind photography? Um, somewhat. I think these yeah. days, though, everybody knows somebody with a camera. Like, we're running yeah. into that a lot more now where we're seeing, you know, oh, we were going to hire somebody, but our friends, daughters, you know, has gotten into photography or whatever. And there's more of that now that I've seen in the last couple of years, too. I don't know, Troy, have you seen that or noticed that in your market or your area? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, there's a lot of uh, weekend photographers, but you know, I would say, you know, I, 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 I've been in business for a long time and I've seen this come and go. And what I think happens is that when you have an influx, it, it's a, it's a race to the bottom, but I don't have to race to the bottom and you just have to learn to find your client, right? Yeah. Like, like we, we, let's use food for example, right? Cause everything should be about food. I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> but you know, if, if you feel like going out for sushi, 
um, the barbecue place isn't really in competition with your business, but you've decided that that's where you want to go today. So what I would suggest for photographers coming up or for somebody who's struggling in their business, look at where your market is, look at who you want to reach and find out where they are because then you're not actually competing with the $500 shoot and burn guys because your clients, they want wall portraits or they want wedding albums. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to do and I, and, I, and I totally get it. It's hard to build that business. But you know, my clients are so focused on, you know, we want to build our album and, and we want to put up wall portraits and things. It makes it easier for me to not compete um, with the people who are, are weekend shooters. You know, because yeah. it's we're different clients. My clients see the photography different. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's that's basic marketing right there, right? I mean, right. You don't, and I say this a lot, a lot to people when I put on my marketing hat. It's the who do you want to be? Right? Do you want to do you want to be Tiffany's or do you want to be the jewelry counter at Walmart? Right? You have so. to you have to know your client, and it's it's an easy statement because when I teach business classes, we talk about that. Because Tiffany's and Walmart have different clients. Yeah. I mean, core clients, right? Like there's overlap. We get that. Mm -hmm. But they market differently. Their color palettes are different. Everything they do is different. Yeah. I'm marketing to a different core bride than, yeah. than somebody else down the street who's, you know, budget. Um, Cause and that's good. And they, and those brides that know that look at you know what they're getting and they know what they're going to be paying for. It's a known quantity versus, right. and I, I was saying in the, in the show, Bruce, I don't know if you remember this a couple of years ago, we were talking about wedding stuff and it was the, I think he said something around, it was either you or Robert Evans. I remember it was around the fee that you pay the wedding photographer is a per, it's, if it's a pie, a percentage of that pie goes to the artisanship of the photographer to create stunning images. But a, there's another slice of that pie, which is insurance. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So you're paying for someone not to screw up your wedding. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you don't pay insurance, you're going to get somebody that's going to be like, hey, sorry, but uh, my autofocus wasn't working for half of your wedding. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and, I, and I only showed up with one camera and one lens. So, yeah, my battery sorry. died. Sorry. sorry. So I did the rest with my phone. I hope you don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> so. But that's that's totally true, though. I mean, uh, you know, Bruce, anybody who's been shooting for a long time, you've walked into a scenario and then all of a sudden, uh, everything changes. Maybe it rained that day or the bride is two hours late. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Her expectations are the same. She still mm -hmm. wants you to, to, to create those magical moments. You know, maybe she bought a cathedral uh, length veil and there's no wind to help you out. Mm -hmm. You know, right. <laughs> you, you've got to make it work. And there's no excuses when you're done. Yep. But that's yeah. also why I love this job because mm -hmm. it's not easy. No, you know? yeah. it's not. Yeah. 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 That's for sure. All right, guys. Well, let's close this off with the final, final thoughts here. Uh, we got through two. I don't know if you guys have a third that you want to throw out there, Troy. You have a third mistake that you want to warn the the folks are away from. I do. I do. I actually have a list, but this one's at my top. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, I and, feel like another show is going to be in this. <laughs> and you know, I, I I mean this in the in the kindest way, though. Is photographers. Um, get so wrapped up in what they're doing that they often <clears throat> forget that there's a whole another event going on. And photographers, especially in a wedding, have to realize that you're not shooting for you. You're shooting for the couple. You're shooting for their for their memories. And if you have to be able to read your couple, if she's worn out or he's worn out or they're done, doesn't matter how beautiful that sunset is. You have to let them enjoy their day. Yeah. Don't take them out and disappear for 45 minutes during the reception because the sunset looks good. D take them out for five minutes mm -hmm. and then come back. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that that would be it. Basically, you shoot for the client, not for you. I like that because that, that, that goes that's really good because that goes to uh, being what's empathy. Right. So so having empathy for the client and that this is their magical day. Yeah, you got a job to do and you want to make sure you have some good pixels to work with in Lightroom or Capture One or whatever later. Right. But right. at the same time, you don't want to dominate their day getting your stuff. Right. So I, I love that. That's a that's a great point. Bruce, what do you think? You got any parting shots or for a number three? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and this is something I, I still struggle with even after, you know, after 10 years in the business is, is trying to not always take things personally. Um, it's hard sometimes to separate the personal from the, from the business, right? We're hired to do a job. We're hired to capture these images, but we also get fairly close to our clients. We get to know them pretty well. You know, we're there for moments that perhaps nobody else gets to be a part of. For example, you know, the first look, for example, sometimes, you know, even their closest friends and family aren't there for that. You know, we're mm -hmm. there in that moment. So we, we tend to form a really good relationship and hopefully you know, everything goes well and there's no issues and there's no problems. But sometimes there's things that, that, that happen, things that come up. Uh, sometimes things that are beyond our control as photographers uh, that could lead to, you know, there being some 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 disappointment or, you know, what ha or, or, you know, regrets after the wedding when the bills start rolling in and and they you might end up being the, the one in the line of fire. Um, yeah. even though you did a fantastic job and delivered great images, I see this a lot in, in forums and things and say, Oh, you know, it's, it's finally happened. I have, <clears throat> you know, the upset bride or the upset groom that's not happy with their photos. And, uh, you know, they share the gallery and all the other photographers say like they're, you know, they cray because <laughs> they're this yeah. looks fantastic. And there yeah. could be other things going on, you know, in outside of their world that, you know, maybe somebody lost a job and, and they're just, you know, they're panicked with bills. And so sometimes it's hard to not take some of these things personal um, and separate them from the, the from the business. And I struggle with that sometimes Two things will come up and sometimes it's hard to not, not take them personally and kind of yeah. separate them. And, and I tend to hang on to things a little bit, maybe than, more than I need to, right? Yeah. And so I think just being able to kind of let go um you know and and uh yeah separate that the business side from the personal side um one little thing a mistake we made in our first couple of years in business uh is not taking enough uh, in as a retainer so this might help some photographers that are out there you know when we started our business the first couple of uh years we were only taking a small amount as the retainer in our first year in business first full year in, in doing weddings we only had we had six weddings booked and we had three of those weddings cancel on us for, mm. for various reasons. And we were only taking a small amount as the retainer. And so we learned very quickly at that point, you know, we need to bump up that retainer amount to make sure we're protecting ourselves more because we're essentially guaranteeing our services and we only have a finite number of those Saturdays and Sundays. Did, did bumping the retainer up, did that um, eliminate or reduce the number of cancellations or did it just you know, you still had cancellations, but you have more money in the bank at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't really change anything as far as the cancellations. I think that was just a really, that was a bit of a weird year to have like half of the weddings we had booked cancel. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we've had, you know, each year there's usually one that, that either they have to postpone or they cancel or something that, that comes up. Right. But uh, so we took that as a, as a, an opportunity to improve our business. We looked at things that happen and mistakes that happen. And those are always learning opportunities. You have to stop and look at those and say, what could have I done better? What, you know, what could we change? You always have to look at those mistakes. That's how we learn. That's how we grow our businesses is we look, we have to look at those mistakes and we have to accept them and, and learn to grow for what they are rather than just sort of sitting back and go, Oh, wow, that bride and groom there, you know, that's their problem. Love it. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. You gotta, if for if anytime you put your yourself, your, your ego on the line by creating or by doing creative work that's for sale, you got to have a thick skin. Right? Mm -hmm. You do. Saying, you do. Yeah. Cause yeah. people, people will be in bad moods or for whatever reason, don't like your work or like you say, you have financial difficulties or whatever. And then it falls down on you. And yeah, so you, then that's where the professional professionalism comes in. Like we were talking about at the beginning, you have to be the consummate professional, I think, in any kind of genre where you're doing customer service based things and trading on your creative talents. You have to take the high road all the time because you're I don't I don't see I, I can't imagine either one of you get into a shouting match with a <laughs> with a potential bride. <laughs> yeah, no, never. Yeah, it, it, no. Because it's not about me. I mean, and what Bruce said is absolutely true is that, you know, we have such <clears throat> uh, uh, of our own self invested in that day. And, and, you know, we get there early, we scout locations. I know when the sun's coming down, I, I mean, like, I really want to make this amazing. And then maybe she shows up late because dad couldn't find his jacket or whatever. You know, I can't, I, I have to just roll with it and yeah. just realize, you know what, it's an honor for me to be here, right? For them to choose me to be there is a really big deal. And uh, just take it in stride, make the day work, make them happy. They remember it happy. Everything's wonderful. And then, you know, the gear performs and, you know, all those years of practice work and then it all comes together. And I think that's what that's what frustrates me about beginners and people who are making all these mistakes is they don't see the big picture. You know, yeah. I can see the future on the wedding day. 
Bruce can see the future. We can see the future. We see that groomsman. We know. <laughs> we know how that guy's going to be. You know? Uh, you yeah, get a I've grumpy you, coordinator. I've seen you before. I've seen you before. <laughs> you get a grumpy coordinator or or you get another vendor who doesn't want to play nice. You just, you just know. And you yeah. have to just roll with it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, the, to cap, put the end cap on that is you guys were talking about what to charge earlier. And I think if you feel like even subconsciously as a, as a photographer or a vendor, if you feel like that you're adequately or well compensated for the job that you're doing, it'll affect the final product, right? Where on the other hand, if you feel like you're that $500 photographer and you have that snotty wedding coordinator or the angry DJ saying, get out of the way or whatever, you're like, I'm only, I'm getting $500 for this, man. I don't care. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to affect the final product. So uh, yeah, I think it's uh, not, not, that's not, that's not to say that you shouldn't be professional at all times, but I think even subconsciously, if you're only, if you're getting, you can paid, let's say I'm picking a number out of the sky, five grand to shoot a wedding versus $500. And that five grand is going to make you have much more tolerance, I think, at the end of the day <laughs> for a bridezilla than five hundred dollars would. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, all right, guys, let's move on to uh, we're going to close out the show in a second. I think we had some technical difficulties on the on Google. There's the buffering. I'm getting people saying the buffering is just insane. Um, so sorry about that, guys. Um, but let's just run through these questions real mm -hmm. quick. The first one is from Mike. Mike says, how has the wedding photography business changed in terms of revenue potential over the past or the last decade? Is it still worth it? Hmm. Is it? You've, been, you've been in this longer than me. I'll let you take that one. Um, <laughs> I do think it's still worth it. I, I, I really, really do. It's, uh, it's hard to um, achieve that plateau where you're in the business and you're making a living now. Um, it's, it, there's a lot more to go through to get here. And I will say, I haven't, we haven't changed our prices in probably, uh, I'm going to say 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. um, because my market where I'm at will just not bear more. So I am putting in more time. However, um, it is profitable and I can make a living and I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at. I'm happy with what I make and the number of, of, of weddings that I do. So short answer Yes, yes, you can, and it's and it's worth getting into. Interesting. Okay, all right. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, question number two is from Montgomery. Montgomery says, "Can I successfully shoot a wedding alone, or do I need a helper?" Mm. Hmm. I, I mean, that's I, tough. I always, it? That's a tough it, one. It's tough because I always have you know my wife with me as a second shooter. Um, and there's certainly there's there, she's invaluable in terms of you know the, the assistance she provides and she enables me to do certain things that that if I was by myself I, I might not necessarily uh, be able to do uh, you know just the ability to just to, even if it's something simple like going to move lights or, or or grab some gear out of the car that we forgot or something like that it you know it it gives me that opportunity to capture something that maybe I I, I might have missed had I had to go myself to go get it. So yeah. having that second person there is just, you know, it's, it's somebody to, you know, bounce, you know, if you have that moment where you're a little bit frustrated and you don't want to, you know, it's you know, obviously that's not something you want to show to the client, but you got to let off steam a little bit. That's maybe a moment when you've got somebody to talk to in the car on the drive between, you know, formals to the reception, <laughs> you know, you go, okay, right, let's right, get it right. out. That, you know, geez, that's so and so. And then you, you know, you put on the happy face and you, and you carry on. So it's, you know, just to have even that emotional support there with you on the day, I think is, is really good. Sometimes situations happen, you know, uh, I've had, you know, I've, I've second shoot still with other photographers and, you know, that if they fall in sick or, you know, I had one girl that she went to go do something and she, she cracked her head open in the middle of the shoot. She hit a tree branch and she came out of the bushes and she's, you know, bleeding. And so she says, you got to take over for me for a few minutes here while I go, you know, Jeez, wow. her up my head. And so having that second person there, you know, is, is good. Do, do you, do you have, could, you know, I could go, I probably could go and shoot a wedding by myself. I, you know, I've done some smaller, shorter engagements, you know, three, four or five hour weddings where I've done those just by myself, um, shorter days, but usually for the longer full days, the eight, the 10 to 12, I find it, it's, it's helpful to have, you know, a second person there with you, even if they're not a second shooter, even if they're, if they hire an assistant, that's just going to help you kind of lug gear and, 
and you know go grab your granola bar or something when you're in the heat of the moment. right um, right yep you know sometimes that's that's helpful to have right and there's a lot of newer photographers that's a great example of a position for a newer photographer that's maybe wants to gain that wedding experience is to come along and it might not be sexy or glamorous it might be dragging and schlepping gear but it's it's a great way to experience a wedding day and really see everything that goes into a wedding day uh, before you actually take one on yourself. So that you know that's an opportunity as well for newer photographers that are looking to kind of get into that space. Yeah. So yeah. you know. Yeah, just, that's what I, I used to hear that a lot is, you know, the the path, the 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 path to this kind of business is apprenticeship and oh, second absolutely. shooting until you feel comfortable and then you take on the reins and then you bring on a second shooter and so on and so on. Do you you agree with that, Troy? I do. No, I everything he said was absolutely true and and I think that this is one of the one of those type of careers that being an apprentice is so important because you have to understand um, what's going on before you engage in it? I will say though, I mean, if 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 you're a female and you're you're shooting by yourself, you have you have a little bit more access, you know, like to the girls' rooms, the girls getting ready. Can you go in and check on them? So having that second assistant, because I you know shooting with my wife, um, it's great. I can go like you know I'm gonna go shoot the guys, go check on the girls, see how they're doing, see if they're ready, um, and that's that's awesome. You know, that's a, an amazing way to work. I, I do end up tying a lot of the corset dresses and, and fixing <laughs> veils and things. Yep. Though. Uh, you have to be able to do that. But yes, uh, I would almost say it's, man I don't want to say it's mandatory, but I would strongly suggest that you take along an assistant, even if it's just to help you carry stuff. I love that. Yeah. So I, I would say the, it sounds like the exception to the rule should be shooting a wedding alone. Right. The yeah. rules should be, if at all possible, I'm going to shoot this with at least one other person, but stuff happens. So, you yeah. know, I, if, if I have to do it alone, I can do it. I'm proficient enough to shoot a wedding solo, but if I can, I'll do it with someone else. And, and Troy brings up a good point too, about the, the, the male female dynamic too. It's, you know, there are some cultural weddings where there are certain times in, like in a temple or some of these kinds of things where, uh, you know, I've shot some, you know, some weddings where, you know, the female isn't allowed into a certain area be right. for religious reasons, mm -hmm. right? So the, I'm the only one that can go back there and vice versa, right? The same thing. And even for, um, you know, big, a big issue in our industry right now, it's being talked about right now is, you know, obviously with the whole Me Too movement and things like that is things are dealing with sexual harassment and, you know, um, a lot of female photographers, particularly wedding photographers, you know, sadly have to deal with this, um, you know, at weddings with, you know, overly aggressive uh, groomsmen and, and whatnot. So having that yeah. second person there, you know, to kind of have your back and keep an eye on things, I think is is important. It's it's sad that it's come to that in our world that, that, that that's happening, and I feel you know awful. But I know friends who have experienced that and who've gone through that at weddings, and it's you know. I can it's, imagine it's a it's a festive event. You got mm -hmm. people that are drinking and partying, yeah. and you got this person running around. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, just to yeah. just have somebody watch your gear. Mm -hmm. Is is oh, right. important, yeah. you know? Like, hey, I'm gonna go shoot the cake cutting. Uh, can you watch the bags? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember, you know, yeah. Sarah, Sarah Sarah everywhere. I think said one time a few years ago there was a there was a pattern. I think it was in L.A. or something that that there were thieves were going around and they were targeting weddings and they were showing up dressed, you know, like nicely dressed in suits and stuff, and they were going into weddings and casing the room and looking for a photographer's gear and walking out with it. And they were, dre you know, dressed nicely and nobody asked questions. And this was a, this was a problem, I think, in the at one point in time. Wow. Yeah. Humans. Now so you just humans. gave everybody that idea, Bruce. Yeah, so well, I know. I think that, like, that idea yeah. is already out there. So. I know what I'm doing <laughs> this is, weekend. <laughs> All right. Uh, last question real quick is from Thomas. Thomas says, what's the best camera system for weddings? That's a loaded question. <laughs> literally. The one that works? Yeah. 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 The one you have with you, the one you can afford, the one, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's a right question to that, right? I, I mean, or a right, a right answer to that question. No, I don't think there is a finite right answer. I, I will say that, um, you know, the gear doesn't make the photographer, but a good photographer can take advantage of the gear. Um, and I shoot with all top, top end Nikon gear. So like the D850, the D5. I also have a full Sony set. Um, and I can tell you that the Nikon gear that I use focuses better in low light and faster than does my Sony gear. So mm. does that mean it's it's something you have to have? Does that mean that it's better? No, but I like to be able to shoot in low light by natural light, and I like it to be able to focus fast. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, so it's, it's subjective, right? Very, it's, it depends very. depends on how you shoot, yeah. what you shoot, budget, you know, how heavy a camera you want to carry. It just goes on and on and on. I think yeah, there's so a minimum. A whole show. I think there's a minimum. I mean, you need you need to walk into a wedding with two bodies. You can't show up with just one body because that's mm. you know, something's going to fail, right? You need to have that backup. So you have a good, reliable backup. Um, I think it's really important to have a system that can take two memory cards so that you've mm. got redundancy in your camera. So every time you're clicking that shutter, there's two copies of the images being written. And these are all things that a professional photographer are going to bring to the table, meaning our gear is more expensive. We've got twice the car. This is insur that back to that insurance piece as to why are we more than the $500 shooter? The $500 right. shooter is showing up with a Canon Rebel and one memory card. They probably don't have, you know, we have a, a whole tickle trunk of lighting in our, in our vehicle uh, that we pull out. And if we get into the situation, like, you know, it rains, and we, you know, we don't have great light. While well, we act, we can create our own light, we can take a really d dingy, crappy situation and make it look good. So there's kind of a minimum complement, I think, of gear that that you need to have if you want to get into into weddings. And I would say, you know, two bodies, dual cards, some lighting, um, and a few good lenses. I think that's you know a minimum as far as Sony, Fuji, whatever, mirrorless, SLR. That's you know, I there's love so it. Many I love it. Great options out there right now, but. Yeah, we could talk a lot on gear. There, I mean, there's a there's a lot of reasons to to pick certain gear, and as you know, being the gear heads that we all are, I think uh, there could be a lot of conversation about gear. But Bruce is mm -hmm. absolutely right when it comes to there is a minimum level uh, of of professional gear to pull the day off. And backups backups do not mean you know your G10. You know, a backup yeah. is another yeah. mm -hmm. another body equal it's to not what your you phone, have. right? <laughs> it's not your phone. Yep. No, even yeah. though it's good. Yeah. Uh, it's not a backup. No, right. No. All right, guys. Uh, I feel like there's another show in this that I mean, there's at least two other shows maybe <laughs> that we could go into one on gear, one on pricing. Uh, we, we could do a whole wedding series, I think. Um, but unfortunately, we're at the end of another episode of this week in photo. But the good thing is you guys can continue the conversation, listeners and watchers in our community over at Twip pro.com you can connect with me or these guys or you can stalk these guys directly you can stalk bruce at moments in digital.com and troy at imagery concepts.com we'll put their links in the description for this video on youtube and also in the blog post over on this week in photo.com any parting shots you guys want to throw out there that you'd like people to know about or things you have coming up you want to share nothing specific no, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing, I'm crickets, going, nothing, nothing. I'm going back to Japan in a couple of weeks. <laughs> You're all, you should just get an apartment there, dude. <laughs> Maybe. No, I'm not always there. I lived there for two years, but I haven't been back for oh, a long time. So I'm actually uh, taking my wife over there for the first time. So we're going to spend a couple of weeks traveling. So yeah, that's I'm, cool. I've been traveling lately. I've been having some fun just doing, shooting a little bit more video, just personal stuff when I travel. So that's been kind of fun. So I need to get back to Japan so, for real. Like right yeah. now. When's, when's, when, when's the last time you were there? Oh man, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. I don't even want to talk about it. It's been long. <laughs> so yeah, so it's we're been going too long. There for a couple of weeks before wedding season kind of kicks in, and uh, we're going to enjoy cherry blossom season over there, and yeah. then come back home, kind of recharged and re-energized, and ready to tackle the next next wedding. Snow season. monkeys. This is Martin Bailey and those snow monkeys. I want to get up there and shoot those guys. Yeah. 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 Just get but out. Right. Just get out and photograph. Go be creative. Yep. Just I, yeah. I think yeah. that's just, yeah. Go do something. Yep. I think that's, that's it. You know, get out there, get out there and shoot and, um, don't let your camera sit in your camera bag gathering dust. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Unless so. it's a GoPro. <laughs> yeah, it's a GoPro. <laughs> it's from the stockholder. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, coming up next week on This Week in Photo, it's all about getting started in underwater underwater model photography with Craig Colvin and Craig Stampley, two members of the Twip Pro community. Remember, head over to twippro.com and uh, join the community. Jump in the water and hang out with us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the show and hit that bell to be notified when we release new videos. And you'll always be up to date on all things Twip. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>